For those old enough to remember, the video game era began with the Atari 2600. The very word Atari, for many, dredges up a host of memories from the 1970s. A clunky plastic case nestled in shag carpet, blocky graphics on a fuzzy television screen, and assorted hums and beeps. It seems as though everyone who grew up in the 1970s either had an Atari or knew someone who did. The system was so ubiquitous that Atari became shorthand for video games in general. Few recall, if they ever knew, that Atari had to battle two rivals to achieve market dominance, and that these rivals created the key features of game consoles, not Atari. The first video game war is a tale of visionaries, one-upmanship, and decisions with unexpected consequences. Today, the makers of video game consoles know they're in for a tough fight when they introduce a new system. In the 1970s, though, none of the participants could have imagined what they were getting into. The story of video games begins with a group of hackers enrolled in the engineering school at MIT. In those days, the word hacker didn't refer to someone who broke into computer systems, but instead, someone who got machines to do more than they were designed to do, the geek equivalent of a hot rodder. In 1961, a group of engineering students wanted to push the school's PDP-1 mini-computer to do things no one had ever seen before. Taking their cues from their favorite science fiction stories, they designed a game where two spaceships flew around the PDP-1's display and shot at each other. Once the basic prototype was completed, the students kept finding ways to improve it, adding an accurate star field background, simulating the effects of gravity, and building a control box out of the spare parts borrowed from the school's model railroad club. They called their creation Space War. Digital Equipment Corporation, the company that made the PDP-1, was so impressed with Space War that it began installing the game on new systems before they left the factory. This spread Space War fever to colleges across the country, including the University of Utah, where a student named Nolan Bushnell played the game and imagined big commercial possibilities. He moved to California and convinced a company to let him design a coin-operated version producing the first arcade video game, Computer Space. Although the design borrowed heavily from Space War, it was very different in one important way. The PDP-1 computer that ran Space War cost the equivalent of around $1 million today. So, despite the name, there was no actual computer inside Computer Space. Instead, its game logic was controlled by relatively simple hardwired circuits. Computer Space was a financial failure, with only about 500 units produced. The game was ahead of its time, with controls that were too complicated compared to the pinball machines that had preceded the game in bars and pizza parlors. A player's ship was controlled using four buttons. One rotated the ship left, one rotated right, one activated thrusters to push the ship forward, and one fired rockets. Although this control scheme seems simple to current gamers, it's essentially the same as the later arcade hit Asteroids, it was too much for people who had never seen a video game before. Players couldn't get a handle on how to play, and the game died. But Nolan Bushnell wasn't done with gaming. While Bushnell was inventing the arcade video game, another man was inventing the home video game console. Ralph Baer was born in Germany in 1922, a Jewish child in an increasingly anti-Semitic country. In 1938, he and his parents fled to America. After his stint in the U.S. Army, Baer earned a degree in the nascent field of television engineering and joined defense engineering firm Sanders Associates. Like the MIT students who created Space War, Baer was a hacker at heart always tinkering with whatever equipment he could get his hands on. He invented a number of clever devices for the military, including a parachute for air cargo crates that would automatically open as the crate neared the ground, greatly improving the accuracy of airdrops. The game console that made Bear famous began as a prototype that he called the Brown Box, 
after the wood grain tape that held it all together. Like Bushnell's computer space, the brown box used hardwired logic circuits instead of a programmable processor to keep the design affordable. The games it played were primitive, but when Bayer took his invention to the patent office for a demonstration, examiners came running from all over the building for a chance to play. He knew he was on to something big. Sanders Associates needed a partner to turn the brown box into a commercial product, and they chose Magnavox. Magnavox tweaked Bayer's design and gave it a grand name, the Odyssey. The brown box was now a white pyramid, with a slot for game cards and two controllers wired to the main console. The controllers were also white pyramids, with wood grain stickers on the top. Compared to game controllers of today, which are ergonomically designed to fit in the hand, the Odyssey controllers were large and unwieldy. The Odyssey's display capabilities, or graphics, were primitive. 1972 was the first year that the majority of television sets sold were color, so black and white sets were still the norm, and the video output of the Odyssey was limited to black and white. In fact, all the Odyssey could do was display three white squares on a black background. To offset the deficiencies of the graphics, the console was packaged with a number of accessories for specific games, including dice, poker chips, and play money. Each game also had its own translucent sheet that players were instructed to tape to their television screens. The most popular Odyssey game was Tennis, with an overlay that showed a bird's eye view of the court. The three white squares were produced by the Odyssey, two large squares representing tennis rackets, and a smaller square representing a tennis ball. The court and the player outlines were printed on the overlay. During a game, the ball would bounce off the rackets, and the goal was to slip the ball past your opponent and off the left or right edge of the screen. If the ball went off the top or the bottom of the screen, neither player scored. But players were responsible for making that call, as the console did not keep score. In the sort of overstatement that was common in the early era of video games, the manual claimed that Odyssey's tennis reproduced all the excitement of Wimbledon. Although the console was an exciting innovation, it had little staying power in the market. At a cost of around $100, the equivalent of around $565 today, Magnavox was able to sell the initial production of 100,000 units, but declined to make more. The reliance on hardwired logic circuits was the Odyssey's undoing. Players chose different games by slotting different circuit cards into the console. This superficially resembles the game cartridges of later systems, but the Odyssey's cards contain no programming code. They simply connected the fixed circuits inside the console in different ways. As such, there was no way to create totally new games for the system. What players saw when they first powered on the Odyssey was all the system could ever do, and it wasn't much. It couldn't even make sounds. Although the Odyssey sank quickly, it initially made a big splash, catching the attention of Nolan Bushnell. Still convinced of the commercial value of video games, he had created his own electrical engineering firm, Syzygy, and hired a young engineer named Al Alcorn as his first employee. As a training exercise, Bushnell asked Alcorn to design a ping pong game similar to the Odyssey's tennis. Alcorn refined the concept. His game could keep score, and the balls would rebound at different angles depending on where it struck a player's racket. When Bushnell saw the result, he decided to turn the training exercise into a commercial product dubbed Pong. Before he could start signing up distributors for the machine, though, he had to take care of a problem. The name Syzygy was already in use by another California company. Bushnell went through a list of terms used in the ancient strategy game Go until he found one that caught his ear, Atari, which has a meaning similar to you're in check in chess. Introduced in 1973, Pong was an immediate success, with thousands of the cabinets sold in the first year. Even more successful was the home version. 
Licensed to Sears, just in time for the Christmas season of 1975, 150,000 units were sold in just a few months. The success of Pong wasn't bringing smiles to everyone, though. Ralph Baer saw the game as an obvious copy of his Odyssey tennis game and convinced Magnavox to sue. Beyond the clear connections in gameplay, the Pong design infringed on many of Bear's basic video game patents, such as using a television screen as a display monitor. Magnavox won in court, leaving Atari no choice but to sign a licensing agreement for Pong. By the time of the settlement, though, the market was saturated with cheap Pong clones, and neither company reaped the rewards of their designs. Bushnell moved on, setting his sight on a grander achievement, a specialized computer for playing an endless variety of games. Under the code name Stella, Atari had been working towards this goal from the beginning. Instead of hardwired circuits, Stella would be powered by a programmable microprocessor so that the variety of games would be limited only by his designer's imaginations. Everyone, Bushnell thought, would want one of these in their living rooms. Unfortunately for Bushnell, other people had the same idea, including two engineers named Wallace Kirshner and Lawrence Haskell, who together made up half of the technical team at the tiny Alpex Computer Corporation of Connecticut. The pair had developed a prototype game console they called the Raven, short for Remote Access Video Entertainment. The first game they made was yet another version of Bear's tennis game, now described as ice hockey. The Raven, though, was not a hardwired Odyssey clone. It used an actual microprocessor, an Intel 8080, for game logic. Having a microprocessor meant the Raven needed a place to store the programming code for its games. The most obvious place to store the game programs was in ROM chips soldered to the circuit board. The word ROM stands for read-only memory. ROM chips store program instructions and data that never change. In contrast, data inside RAM, or random access memory, can be changed at will. Today, RAM is cheap. A set of chips with 16 billion storage locations, known as bytes, can be purchased for less than $100. In the 1970s, though, RAM was very expensive, and $100 would have only bought a couple of thousand bytes. For this reason, early consoles were designed to use as little RAM as possible. Kirshner and Haskell realized that even cheaper ROM chips would be a limitation for the Raven. Including enough ROM to store lots of different games would drive up the cost of the system beyond what was marketable. Besides, if the game chips were soldered to the circuit board, how would new games be added later? The great failing of the Odyssey was that people eventually got bored with the games it came with. Kirshner and Haskell decided to solder the ice hockey ROM chip directly to the main circuit board, but all other games would be wired into small, separate circuit boards that would fit into a slot on the system. The game cartridge had been born. As with Sanders Associates and the Odyssey, the Alpex Computer Corporation needed a partner to develop the Raven into a commercial product. Their choice was Fairchild Semiconductor, the company that had patented the integrated circuit technologies that were used by most of the computer industry. Fairchild's upper management secretly assigned an engineering whiz named Jerry Lawson to work with Alpex on the Raven. Even Lawson's regular supervisor was unaware of this side project, which in hindsight may have been a signal of Fairchild's tepid commitment to video games. Lawson, though, was the perfect choice for the project, having already demonstrated his interest in games by building an arcade game in his garage that he called Demolition Derby. He revised the Raven for commercial production, scrapping the Intel 8080 microprocessor in favor of Fairchild's own F8 chip. The resulting console, released in 1976, was initially known as the Fairchild VES, or Video Entertainment System, but it was soon renamed the Fairchild Channel F. Back at Atari, the introduction of the Channel F set off alarms. 
From his experience with Pong, Bushnell expected the Channel F to spawn a multitude of copycat products. Not wanting to be late to the field, he needed to rush the Stella project to completion. He sold Atari to the media conglomerate Warner Communications in order to get the money needed to finish Stella quickly. In September 1977, about a year after the Channel F's debut, Atari released the Atari VCS, or Video Computer System. As with the Fairchild, the first name didn't stick, and it's best remembered by its later name, the Atari 2600. Meanwhile, the company that produced the first video game console had been more cautious. Engineers at Magnavox had been tinkering with a new console design that, like the Atari and Fairchild models, included a microprocessor and ROM cartridges. Magnavox management, though, wasn't convinced that a sizable market for home video gaming existed. The project teetered on the edge of cancellation until an enthusiastic appeal from Ralph Baer convinced the company to give it a go. In early 1979, well behind the competition, Magnavox unveiled their new creation. Eager to remind the world who created home gaming while emphasizing the leap in power from their first console to the next, they called their new system the Odyssey 2 and stylized the logo as Odyssey Squared. In the next episode, we'll see what set the first generation consoles apart, both inside and out.